Might get this going. Tanakoto. <clears throat> Kowayo. No chendu okutupuna. Ke tamaki makaro aho anoho ana. Ko Charlie Gao aho. Ke roto o ite North Asia Center of Asia Pacific Excellence. Wai Papa Tomataro. Norela Tanakoto Katoa. Hello everyone, I am Charlie Gao. Um, I see some familiar faces in the room. Um, if you're not familiar with me, um, I am the director of North Asia Cape, um, based at the University of Auckland. Um, and we support New Zealand businesses, tertiary students, and educators to grow their knowledge and capabilities um, focused on North Asia, obviously. Um, it's really a privilege to be um, the moderator, your moderator on this panel, on how New Zealand can better enable trade, and perhaps not only just more trade, but enable better trade, um, and also how we can ensure our prosperity going into the future. And we have a brilliant panel of experts here with us today to help us explore this topic. Um, really just one thing for me, which is, um, you would have all read the liner notes, so you can see that the starting off point that we have today is the observation, quite an obvious one, that the pandemic and other world events have really disrupted and done a lot of damage to the global economy, international trade. It's even put pressure on, I think, international relations and cohesion within our societies across the world. New Zealand, as an open trading nation, we really depend on free and fair trade. And um, I should note, though, that in New Zealand, with the exception of our core services sectors of tourism and education, our goods exports over the COVID period have actually increased. And that is in no small part due to our trading relationships within North Asia, where we find New Zealand's number one, number four, and number five highest trading partners, largest trading partners. This picture isn't a simple one though. Um, it's led some observers to worry, is New Zealand too dependent on a single economy? And if we are, will this dependence mean greater fragility to New Zealand um, in the face of rising international political tensions? Um, and we've all heard those metaphors of New Zealand needing to walk a tightrope. Um, I think my very small contribution would simply be that maybe we can summon slightly more positive or less grim um, sort of metaphors or imagery. Um, maybe we can at the very least think that um, New Zealand will need to tread carefully, cautiously, but confidently in pursuing our interests. And we'll obviously need to work with our partners around the world to do that. So to explore this topic, um, I'd like to introduce our panel of speakers. Her, Her Excellency Nina Obermeyer, Ambassador of the EU to New Zealand, Sarah Salmond, partner at Mentor Ellison Rod Watts, and Professor Natasha Hamilton Hart, Director of the New Zealand Asia Institute and Professor of Management and International Business at the University of Auckland. So very quickly introduce the speakers. I'm not reading the whole bio, um, but our first speaker, Her Excellency Nina Obermeyer, has been the EU's ambassador to New Zealand since late 2019. Um, and I had the pleasure of hearing Nina speak um, at the NZIAA conference in Wellington a couple of years ago. Nina was the advisor to the deputy chief negotiator for the UK's withdrawal from the EU, as well as the European Commission's lead negotiator for Ireland and Northern Ireland issues. She held a number of other senior posts in charge of EU relations and negotiations. Nina was previously also a journalist on German television. Nina speaks four languages, only four languages, <laughs> um, English, German, French, and Dutch. And Nina, it's amazing to have you with us here. Thank you, Nina. Um, our next speaker is going to be Sarah Salmond. Um, she is a partner at Minter Ellison Rudd Watts and a corporate lawyer with more than 20 years of experience advising clients in international trade, public law, and regulatory matters. Um, Sarah's expertise, I mean, it was a very, very long list. I had to just pick a few, but um, you know, related to international trade, um, sanctions, customs law, supply chain risk management, market access issues, trade agreements, WTO rows and disputes. Sarah has worked in London, Washington DC and Paris for 10 years before returning to New Zealand in 2000, 
um, in 2012. And I think um, Sarah and I met um, a little bit shortly after she had come back um, from overseas. So Sarah, thank you very much for being with us on the panel. And um, quickly introduce our final speaker, Professor Natasha Hamilton-Hart. Um, Natasha is the director of the New Zealand Asia Institute and professor of management um, and international business at the University of Auckland. Natasha taught at the National University of Singapore for 10 years and held a fellowship at ANU prior to joining the University of Auckland in 2011. Natasha has a range of research interests, including business in Southeast Asia, foreign investment flows, and financial regulation. Um, and Natasha, I really enjoyed your recent paper on NZ Inc. Um, I think it's pretty important reading for those of us in NZ Inc. Um, we're doing certain things well and certain things, um, well, you can always improve certain things. So I thought that was an excellent paper. Um, so Natasha, thank you very much for being with us. Um, so could I please welcome our first speaker, Her, Her Excellency Nina Obermeyer. Inga mana, inga reo, e rauranga tirama, tēnā koto, tēnā koto, tēnā koto katoa. Tēnei te mii ki te tangata whenua, ngāti patua, kei te mii ki a koe Charlie, um, our moderator. And uh, congratulations to NZIAA uh, for having an all-female panel on trade. Yay! <laughs> Very very uh, honored to be to be a part of this and um, before I offer some ways the EU is working to enable international commerce notably in our bilateral relations with New Zealand but also beyond that let me take a moment to recap the journey we've been on for the last couple of years and Charlie has already mentioned some of the disruptors I'm going to talk about for a very brief time the two mega disruptors of recent years and the lessons we've learned from them. Let me start with the, with the pandemic. The pandemic that started as a supply shock around the world and tested the resilience not only of European supply chains and value chains. And many European businesses initially struggled with shortages in supplies caused by closed borders and closed manufacturing sites. But most supply chains quickly recovered. And after the decline in both EU exports and imports in 2020, our trade in goods recovered strongly in 2021 and 2022, just as New Zealand's has done. And I think we can all agree that the pandemic has shown how much our economies rely on international trade and has also accelerated the need to diversify the sources of our inputs and markets. It also brought home to us, to, to the European Union, the strategic dependence on some foreign inputs even before the pandemic. And we had started already prior to COVID-19 hit to seek ways to increase our economy in some key sectors. A quest which has been accelerated by the impact of the virus, but has been further brought home by the Russian aggression against Ukraine. So what have we done and are we still doing to improve the resilience of our supply chains? We are going about this with a policy mix that aims to, one, increase our domestic capacity, two, to diversify our suppliers, and three, to support the multilateral rules-based trade environment, something we've heard a lot about in this morning's sessions, not least by the foreign minister. The European Union has also enhanced its cooperation with like-minded countries, including by making most of the existing trade agreements and by concluding new ones, like our EU-New Zealand free trade agreement. I will speak to that in a, in a second. First mega disruptor, the pandemic. Second and ongoing, Russia's illegal invasion of Ukraine. Just as we put the pandemic behind us, we faced Russia's illegal and unprovoked invasion of Ukraine. In addition to the brutal human cost of this war, human and, if I may add, also environmental cost of this war with the um, explosion or rather the, the, the attack on the dam in Kakovka, it remains a source of uncertainty for the global economy. The European economy has managed to weather this impact remarkably, despite 
um, a, a shock at the, at the very beginning of the war um, and, an, and a feared winter energy crisis by diversifying our energy, surprise, uh, energy um, supply. Energy prices have now fallen and returned to their 2021 levels. And in addition, a very strong labor market has helped to strengthen economic resilience. So the good news is that the EU's economy is holding up remarkably well in a very challenging global context. The bad news on the other side is that Russia's invasion of Ukraine triggered major food insecurity in the developing world, given the importance that Ukraine has as a grain exporter. The EU's priority has been to ensure that grain from Ukraine can continue to be exported to the Middle East and Africa despite the Russian invasion. Zooming out now from these two mega disruptors to the EU's role as a key supporter of international trade. Let me stress that despite the growing political, geopolitical tensions so much, so much has been said about, the EU is one of the most open economies in the world and is committed to free trade. The EU is the top trading partner for 80 countries. This isn't widely known because most trade statistics are broken down by individual countries and not by bloc, whereas the EU, of course, is uh, trading as a bloc of 27 countries. The EU also ranks first in both inbound and outbound international investments. And we remain the strongest global champion for a reformed WTO underpinned by a functioning and relevant global rules base. One example for that is the EU leading the establishment of the multi-party interim arbitration agreement, given that the appellate body has ceased to function as it should a couple of years ago, something we've worked on very closely with New Zealand. But this standing of the EU as a trade bloc um, won't help to enable international commerce all by itself. Much like New Zealand, what we're trying to do is to build relationships wherever we can. Relationships beyond North-North cooperation, but globally on cutting edge areas. For example, we're working with India on artificial intelligence, semiconductors, telecom standardization, resilient value chains, and foreign direct investment screening. We've also worked with New Zealand, who has been uh, one of the first members of the Trade Ministers for Climate Alliance that was announced two months ago. And as part of our strategy on cooperation in the Indo-Pacific region, we are working on new trade and investment opportunities. Almost precisely a year ago, we concluded negotiations on a free trade agreement with New Zealand, and negotiations with Australia and Indonesia are ongoing. We also relaunched negotiations on a free trade agreement with India in June last year, and more recently with Thailand in, my May, in March uh, 2023. Difficult to talk about international trade without mentioning China. And the minister um, has also spoken to the relation with China earlier in her speech um, today. In less than 50 years, China has moved from widespread poverty and economic isolation to be the world's second largest economy and a leader in many cutting edge technology. More than 800 million people were lifted out of poverty this is one of the greatest accomplishments of the past half century. China, China remains an essential trading partner for the EU. Our trade value is of 2.3 billion euros per day. However, and you will have heard that, um, our economic relationship continues to be unbalanced, characterized by a large trade deficit of almost 400 billion euros. It is also characterized by distortive economic practices and strategic dependencies, not least when it comes to critical raw materials that are so badly needed for Europe's green and digital transitions. We see an urgent need to rebalance our relationship, and we should seek more transparency, predictability, and reciprocity. And a central part of our future China strategy must be as 
President von der Leyen, Commission President von der Leyen, set out a couple of weeks ago economic de-risking. This is very different from decoupling. And just picking up on what Ambassador Abansour said in the panel before, our triptych, our approach to China remains the same. Partner, rival, competitor. Added to this is a, th a strengthening of the economic security elements in our relationships, and this is what we mean by de-risking. And I understand that this is something that is also discussed within New Zealand, and the, and the minister hinted as much, in particular as regards diversification of exports, and, uh, and Charlie picked, uh, picked up on that um, in his intro today. Let me now turn for a brief moment to the bilateral EU-New Zealand trade relationship with the highlight and milestone, of course, the free trade agreement, where negotiations were concluded a year ago and the signatures expected very, very soon. You will have heard and seen the good news on tariff removals, market access and investment. The deal is expected to grow EU-New Zealand trade by 30% and increase EU investment in New Zealand which is already one of the largest, by up to 80%. 91% of New Zealand's current trade will enter the EU duty-free on entry into force of the free trade agreement, rising to 97% after seven years. This includes full or almost full liberalization for a number of New Zealand primary products that are currently subjected to tariffs that your competitors are not subjected to. And we've heard that many times prior to the conclusion, such as kiwi fruit, onions, apples, mussels, lobsters, wine and honey, including manuka on day one, tariff-free access to the EU market. The EU is fully aware of the importance of meat and dairy products for New Zealand. How could we not be? <laughs> These are also, as you know, very sensitive products for the EU, which meant that we had to strike the right balance between the importance of these products for the New Zealand economy while safeguarding the interests of EU farmers and rural communities. And I think gauging from the grumblings on both sides, we found, we found the right balance. And let me also mention some of the other parts of the deal, which I believe will have a lasting impact on the relationship. The EU-New Zealand FTA is a first for us in many regards. It contains the most ambitious sustainability commitments in a trade agreement that have ever been negotiated, thereby setting a new international benchmark on trade and sustainability, makes a strong commitment to climate action, to preserving the planet for our children and grandchildren. Importantly for businesses, the chapter liberalizes green goods and services and will make trade and investment in low carbon goods, services and technology easier. This includes zero tariffs on green goods, such as renewable energy and energy efficient products, including wind turbine towers and solar panel elements. But there is another first in our free trade agreement, and that's the first ever indigenous trade and economic cooperation chapter, which I'm immensely proud of, because you might imagine as a bureaucrat and as our very experienced trade negotiators in Brussels that had, had never negotiated such a chapter, it was quite a learning curve for us as well. And there is, unfortunately, the panel on indigenous uh, international cooperation is taking place at the same time as this one. Otherwise, I would have liked to, to listen in. And I think we will be seeing this debate resonate um, on the wider international stage much more in the, in the years to come. So uh, a trade and economic cooperation chapter that will see closer cooperation between Māori and EU enterprises. With the FTA now concluded and ratification and implementation um, on the horizon, what we are seeing is that our relation is growing further and that the FTA actually acts as a catalyst. For example, New Zealand has just become an associate partner to Horizon Europe, allowing the world's largest research program, allowing New Zealand-based researchers to receive funding for collaborative projects with partners in the EU. And there is no limit to the topics where we can work together, especially on our major global challenges, climate change, digital, energy, and health. And every academic researcher or scientist I speak to is very excited about these new uh, opportunities. And yes, this is about democracies working together. Democracies and the values that underpin them 
must demonstrate their ability to deliver on today's global challenges. I think there is great potential in like-minded partners working together on emerging technologies like AI, economic security and prosperity, secure connectivity and human rights in the digital environment. There's also scope for working together very practically between businesses. And one of the early fruits of the free trade agreement is that we've just launched the New Zealand branch of the Enterprise Europe Network, a worldwide network of innovation and small and medium-sized enterprises support agency, focusing on helping EU and third country partners, SMEs, connect. The partners in New Zealand are Ara Ake and the Auckland Business Chamber, and uh, we will be informing through our social media channels and our website about this. But to conclude, working together to enable international commerce requires engagement at all levels, at the multilateral, the minilateral, the international, and of course the bilateral level, which is what we are working most here in the, in the delegation to New Zealand. Looking forward to ever increased cooperation in the, in the years to come, even once I've left um, beautiful Aotearoa in six months time, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Nina. Um, go for it, Sarah. Good afternoon, everyone. It's great to be here, and thank you, Charlie, so much for the introduction. Now, because the topic or the theme for the conference is solutions, I promise to spend most of my 10 minutes talking about constructive things I think New Zealand can usefully do in order to best enable international commerce in the future. But before I get into that, I'd just like to set the scene briefly by explaining why enabling international commerce is so important for New Zealand, how we've been able to do this quite successfully in the past, but why we're going to need to adopt new strategies in order to be successful in the future. So, first point, international commerce really is crucial for New Zealand. New Zealand, like any other small country, benefits enormously from engaging in international commerce. The small size of our domestic market means that it's crucial for New Zealand in order to drive our economic growth, access resources and knowledge, create jobs, and contribute to our overall development and prosperity. And New Zealand really has been quite um, accomplished at attracting and benefiting from international commerce in recent times. Over the past three decades, the New Zealand economy has become increasingly reliant on international trade. Our trade volumes have grown significantly, and we've, we've also seen significant changes in our trade profile over that time. We have extremely <laughs> broadened the range of products that we export, moving away from agricultural products to take in more high-valued uh, manufactured goods, technology-related products, and specialised niche products. We've markedly increased our services exports, particularly with sectors like tourism, education, financial services, software, IT, and film and creative being very successful. And we've also diversified our export markets away from traditional markets like the UK and Australia. We now have very significant trade volumes going into China, the US, Japan, EU, South Korea, and ASEAN countries. Now, these really significant, exciting changes that we've seen over the past three decades did not happen overnight, uh, and they did not happen by accident, uh, by accident. I think it would be fair to say that a large part of our success over this period has been due to the New Zealand government's relentless pursuit of multilateral trade deals through the WTO and also through bilateral uh, and regional trade agreements. And here I'm talking about the, the long list of agreements with catchy acronyms for names like CPTPP and RCEP and DEPA, etc. And what these trade agreements have all managed to do is enhance New Zealand's integration into the global economy, increase trade opportunities for our corporates, and improve our country's economic performance. And the number one reason why they've been able to do this is because these agreements have removed or reduced foreign countries' import tariffs on products from New Zealand. So trade agreements have been very successful in the past, but I do think very much that we are going to need to adopt different strategies in order to be successful in the future. And this is primarily for two reasons. 
first of all, I think further trade liberalisation via the WTO system is not likely to happen anytime soon. And to be honest, I think a lot of us have known this for probably 20 years. Secondly, I think New Zealand has reached or is rapidly approaching the natural limit of what bilateral and regional trade agreements can do for New, New Zealand business. Now, I appreciate that this is a big call, um, particularly in front of trade policy professionals. Uh, but you don't need to take my word for it. I do believe the trade statistics speak for themselves. Right now, today, 65% of our two-way trade already occurs under a free trade agreement. And when the EU-New Zealand free trade agreement comes into a force next year, and assuming we get a deal with the Gulf Cooperation Council, we will have 78% of New Zealand trade under a trade agreement, which leaves, for the mathematicians out there, 22% uh, of our trade which doesn't occur under an FTA. Now, half of that is with the US, and we would love a free trade agreement with the US, but I think the US administration and Congress have made it quite clear that signing a traditional free trade agreement with New Zealand is not a top priority for them. The other 11% of our trade that doesn't currently occur under an FTA is with a long list of countries, none of whom look like obvious potential FTA partners for New Zealand. The one exception there is India, which is, of course, a huge market, potentially the most populous nation in the world, uh, with a growing middle class and a very attractive export market for a lot of New Zealand businesses. But again, the Indian administration has made it clear that a traditional FTA with New Zealand is not a top priority for them at the present time. So, to summarise, putting aside the potential FTAs we look to sign with the Gulf Cooperation Council, the US and India, which officials should and I believe will continue to advocate for, I do doubt that further FTAs are going to deliver economy-wide benefits that are going to justify the very significant costs associated with negotiating those deals. So, if trade agreements are not the panacea going forward, it does beg the question, well, what is? <laughs> and um, I think it's obviously a very big question, but I have four suggestions as a starter for 10. First of all, I think the New Zealand government needs to conduct a fundamental review of New Zealand's trade policy. The primary objective of this exercise should be to gain a comprehensive understanding of the various non-tariff related restrictions and regulations that hamper New Zealand businesses' access to foreign markets. I think it's really important that this review, um, in this review, the government consults with a broader range of stakeholders this, than is traditionally the case. So not the, just the traditional trade policy experts in New Zealand, but talking to professionals working in logistics, finance, marketing, IT, in order to get a broad commercial picture. And I hope that with this review, the government will be able to identify specific areas where cost savings could usefully and realistically be made, and also to help us develop a new national strategy to help businesses to realise these cost savings. Second of all, I think the, use, the government could usefully seek to address the restrictions and regulation, regulatory divergence identified in the, in the review, primarily by pursuing mutual recognition agreements. I'm not convinced that there is a lot of mileage in trying to address regulatory divergence via plurilateral non-tariff barrier agreements or via regulatory harmonisation. I think history has taught us quite clearly that most governments do not want to bargain away their food safety standards, their technical product standards. So let's take, in a, different, let's take a different approach. New Zealand's regulatory system is generally well regarded. Our products are considered to be high quality and safe. So let's identify markets who we believe have comparable regulatory systems and negotiate deals whereby our products are lawfully able to be sold in their market and vice versa. This is not pie in the sky stuff. We've actually done this successfully with Australia already uh, via the Trans-Tasman Mutual Recognition Agreement. So we have a template here. I think we should try and roll it out for others. Third thing. I think the New Zealand government and New Zealand business representatives should collaborate in order to help uh, make the United States government Indo-Pacific Economic Framework Initiative a commercially meaningful success. It is no secret that the New Zealand business community was disappointed when IPEF was launched, and it was at that time made very clear that it was not going to generate tariff reductions like a traditional FTA would. 
And of course, this is really disappointing news, but sometime in life, we do have to make the most of the opportunities presented to us. And in this case, IPEF does provide an opportunity for officials from across the Indo-Pacific, which is a region comprising 40% of GDP, to sit together and to negotiate deals that will help reduce business costs that harm New Zealand businesses' export competitiveness and profitability. This agreement will be what we make of it. Officials in New Zealand, the US and other countries are calling out for suggestions of how we can make this commercially meaningful. And I do think New Zealand businesses should take the opportunity to give it some serious thought and let their proposals be known. Fourth thing, fourth and final thing on India. I think New Zealand should carefully and creatively look at how we can improve market access to India in the absence of a traditional free trade agreement. And while a traditional free trade agreement um, is unlikely in the near term, we should be ready to move and seize an FTA window if the political, economic and geostrategic uh, circumstances change. But in the meantime, I think we should remember that tariff reductions can be secured outside of a traditional FTA. At any point, a WTO member country is entitled to unilaterally reduce or eliminate a tariff should it choose to do so, so long as the benefits of that market access are made available to all WTO members. So New Zealand exporters and officials should think carefully about what we can offer India as an incentive to reduce some of the country's more restrictive tariffs from a New Zealand perspective. And let's not be modest, there's actually a lot that we can offer India. For example, on agriculture and food security, we could offer technical cooperation in areas such as sustainable farming, crop diversification, post-harvest management, food safety standards. All of this could be very uh, beneficial to India, India in return for a reduction in an agricultural tariff. On renewable energy as well, we've got lots of great experience. We could collaborate on research, technology exchange, capacity building to enhance India's renewable energy sector. There is a lot that we can do together. I think we just need to approach this relationship in a creative way. So in conclusion, I think New Zealand stands at a critical juncture in terms of our trade policy. I believe that the conventional approaches of enabling international commerce through multilateral, bilateral and regional trade agreements are reaching their limits and the future direction of New Zealand's trade policy remains undetermined. We have some meaningful work to do and overcoming the status quo bias is always going to be difficult, but there is reason to be optimistic because New Zealand has been a trade policy innovator in the past. We can do it again, and the best way we'll do it is with officials, businesses, and civil society working together. Thanks very much. Thanks, Sarah. And Natasha, the floor is yours. Well, good afternoon. We have tipped over into the second part of the day. I'm glad to be here. Um, I want 10 minutes to talk about how we might enable international commerce in this new geostrategic landscape. Um, let me do, take a moment, though, just to do a little bit of theme setting, which is that um, what we are seeing uh, in the last five to six years is a partial re-securitization of international economic exchanges. And this fundamentally introduces a new logic into the landscape because when we think of international commerce, business is an area of win-win exchanges. Um, it is positive sum. The pie can grow. That is the nature of international commerce. The security logic works in completely differently. Uh, it is a zero-sum world. When we talk about military security, uh, one actor's increase and win is necessarily a loss for the other party. And so it is a relative gains world when you start looking at things through a security logic. And that, of course, is what the United States in particular has increasingly done in the last five to six years. And this means that we are no longer, at least for some of the time, in a world of win-win, positive-sum outcomes. And this is, this is obviously not a good place to be. Um, 
In terms of how commercial actors have responded to these whole array of new restrictions, exports controls, blacklists, entity lists, and uh, as well as the tariffs, of course, we have already seen some shifts in uh, where pr products are located and new investments going into places where they wouldn't necessarily have done otherwise. Now, some of the, the relocation and restructuring out of China uh, preceded the rise in US-China conflict uh, just for reasons of increasing labor costs or other factors that were feeding into firm decisions. But some of it has clearly been motivated by concerns that they are actually or potentially going to be hit by tariffs or under suspicion under blacklists or that their partners may no longer be considered non-suspicious enough to allow their goods to, uh, to trade freely anymore. Um, and so we have seen um, security motivated, um, or at least, at least sometimes explicitly and sometimes we suspect security mo motivated shifts out of China into plant countries such as Vietnam, India, Thailand, Malaysia in electronics and automotives, for example. Uh, we have seen resource seeking diversification as companies and countries seek to assure their supplies of critical uh, minerals and other resources necessary for the energy transition and also to reduce dependence on ch the Chinese processing market in things like lithium and other critical minerals. And so some of that investment has gone into Indonesia and other countries in the Indo-Pacific. Um, we have seen semiconductor uh, relocations uh, in Japan and announcements of new factories in the United States as part of a very explicit strategy of reshoring uh, and friendshoring. Um, so this is actually has created opportunities, of course, for companies that wouldn't otherwise have been involved in those projects. And for, you know, Arizona may do well in the short term. I'm not quite sure where they're going to find the engineers. Um, but it's obviously at an aggregate level, it is really inefficient because this undoes elements of the supply chain revolution, what is often called the global value chain revolution of the 1990s and onwards, which saw huge gains in efficiency from slicing up the production of goods and distributing them in areas where they can benefit from economies of scale, specialization, co-location, and so on. This is how we have seen the rise of what's called intermediate products trade, global value chains or global production networks that span uh, different markets. Um, this new security logic that part does, does disrupt these connections and re re rewire the circuitry of the regional integration is often going to be inefficient. It is, it is coming at a cost. Um, but this supply chain or global value chain structure of integration is the one that I, I think has actually been a driver of regional integration. The free trade agreements, both at the WTO and the bilateral and plurilateral ones, they create, to some extent, a permissive space. But if you really want to understand why the investment is going where it's going and why the resulting trade flows are happening, you have to look at the inter-firm connections uh, in value chains where firms have forged varying degrees of, of, of varying kinds of partnerships that are somewhat flexible, but also um, not arm's length market-based one-off exchanges that are purely price-based. Um, so this is the, the environment. How do we enable uh, global commerce in this, in this context? And let me offer a couple of thoughts. And, and looking at it um, at the f in terms of firm level strategies rather than necessarily governmental responses, which of course are important too. But for firms who are um, price takers in the political economy world, they, they don't, as individual firms, they don't get to dictate government policy. They can apply for exemptions from blank lists and so on. But in the end, for most companies, certainly for U New Zealand companies, they don't have an inside line to Washington uh, or Beijing, and they're going to need to develop their own responses to the restrictions and risks that they face. So they're going to need to develop a whole array of de-risking strategies. And this will be de-risking about their partners, their suppliers, their clients, their co-investors, their R&D collaborators, and looking at them, I mean, in, in one sense, in a literal sense, to see if they are in fact popping up on the entity list or as a suspicious entity, and looking right through your supply chain to see where there might be a, a problematic point from the point of view of one or other of your 
important markets. Um, the locations that you operate in are also going to have to be scrutinized from the point of view of how vulnerable does being in this place make you to tariffs or other kinds of retaliatory actions. Um, and in some cases, the products. Now, this will vary enormously depending on what economic sector. Some are obviously more um, sensitive and vulnerable than others. Um, but it does mean for all players an increased need to pay attention to the regulatory context, which is constantly changing. Um, and, you know, we're already, you know, New Zealand companies have a lot of reasons to have a good look and have oversight of their both upstream and downstream partners uh, because of increasing concerns around transparency and supply chains for other reasons, but the new security logic provides another um, incentive. The compliance cost of doing this, of course, is going to be very costly because the discovery process itself will be costly and time consuming and it may, you, know, you may not always like what you find and then you will be faced with a decision as to which partnerships to, in, to pursue and which potentially to sacrifice. Now some companies are large enough and able to pursue a sort of dual strategy of more or less dividing up, having running dual supply chains to serve different markets. But for most companies, they're not going to be able to do that and it may not even be tolerated. I mean, it, you know, there, there will, it is quite clear, for instance, that if Huawei is your telecoms partner, you're not going to be operating in the United States. Um, so, you know, even if you wanted to run a dual supply chain, dual facing strategy, um, nobody wants to take, take sides, perhaps, but effectively, the commercial choices, the everyday decisions that you make mean that you will be taking sides and that for what you gain on the one hand, you may well lose on the other. Um, there's not, a, I mean, there, there, are, there are limits to what any individual company, of course, can do in this scenario, as well as just having increased emphasis on transparency and making these choices. But one of the things I think they can do is assess their own value chain position. And there's a lot of talk in New Zealand about being part of global value chains, but the fact is, is we are actually only very peripherally involved in the global value chain chain. And that is because much of our economy, although it has diversified, still remains very much upstream. Um, our re-exports of products where we, you know, we are, we are taking in imports of intermediate products, adding value and re-exporting, they're quite limited. Um, and so we tend to be at the fringes and at the upstream end of a lot of value chains, um, which m without enormous care can create a structure of significant vulnerability where if we think about a network structure, and this is where I would like to show a, a slide if I had one, but you know, we've all seen these, these, these pictures of, of sort of cobweb-like dense interlocking networks. Um, if you're an upstream company and you've got one critical partnership, um, that you are really sitting at the edge of the network. Uh, you only have one point of connection, and that means that you have not developed the kind of structure of mutual surveillance and the necessity of both parties uh, having a strong incentive to care about their reputation and to view each other as having significantly, although not identical interests, but significantly shared interests. So moving towards positions of, of somewhat greater network centrality uh, is probably a critical thing that New Zealand companies can try and equip themselves to do uh, in order to have a more secure position. I mean, a lot of New Zealand companies that we talk to talk about depending on their partners um, on the basis of trust. But trust is actually um, a very dangerous thing to do because it makes you very vulnerable. And quite often, actually, when, when things are working well, what, what we actually discover in a relationship of trust is actually a relationship of mutual surveillance and somewhat more symmetrical dependence. Uh, and that is better than just trusting blindly. Um, it's very important, though, that we understand how to go about developing that that sort of mutual surveillance capacity because it's not developed out of going out to business together or drinking sake together. It is about creating structures where you become a much more integral player, not just with one point of contact in a network, but with multiple points of contact. I think I'm out, out of time now, so I won't say anything about what governments might be able to, to do to support this, but obviously they have a role to play. Thank you.
Well, thank you very much to each of our panelists. Um, we are running a little bit short of time, so I won't take up any through summaries, um, but I found each of them very enlightening from different perspectives, all very solutions focused. Um, so I really, really encourage the younger members of um, our audience, Rangatahi tertiary students, to think of some questions and please ask them. Um, you know, this is quite a difficult setting actually for anyone to ask a question, but um, you know, it does, it does feel like quite a safe space. Um, and I do guarantee that if you are thinking of that question, there's going to be at least 10 other people here be quite happy to ask it. So please do that. Um, I will ask just one quick question to get us going. Um, in the Te Ao Māori perspective, or at least um, in my understanding of the Te Ao Māori perspective, um, one of the ways that you try to think about the future is that you think about younger people, if you're thinking about sort of not too far in the future, but if you're thinking quite far into the future, you're talking about future generations. And so um, that way of thinking often can be quite an effective way to enable you to think longer term, for it to be quite tangible. And then you might want to make investments for future generations. Um, and in that case, if you look at the sorts of investments we need to make around climate, it does actually make a lot of sense to think about what, what are the returns down the line rather than um, the next quarter or the next financial year, uh, much shorter ways of thinking. So um, we have 45 younger people or tertiary students in this room. Um, I know that MFAT as well has supported a number of rangatahi to be here. Um, so my question is actually really simple. Um, to each of our panelists, what would be your message to these uh, leaders of tomorrow? How should they think about the current topic and um, their role, the role that they will play in contributing to New Zealand's future prosperity? Um, and I might start with you, um, Nina, again, in the original order. <laughs> the, I think there's two mics, yeah. Now, yeah, yeah, okay. Uh, yeah, very simple message also for the benefit of time, get involved. Rangatai, get involved. We want to hear your voice when it comes to creating relationships, strengthening relationships, building, enabling international commerce. This is where young voices are, are needed exactly for the reasons you've outlined, a responsibility towards future generations. So get involved and I'll stop here and hand over. Um, it's a great question. Um, I think uh, what I would say is international commerce is a fascinating area, so please do jump in with enthusiasm. As I mentioned in my speech, I think the international trading environment has rapidly changed and is rapidly changing. We are going to need new skill sets. We have a generation of trade policy professionals who come at this from a specific mindset, and we actually need young people to come in with new skills who are willing to challenge our ideas and look at things in a different way. So please do get involved, speak up, challenge us, um, take us into the future. I think I'll just add um, a slightly different element to that, which is that um, the future matters in all cultures. I think everyone imagines at least that they might have grandchildren or, or, or descendants of some sort. Um, and the discount rate that we apply to the future clearly matters. You know, how much do we value a dollar or a, or a benefit in the future compared to today? But the discount rate that we apply to the investments we, we make in the future, whether that's averting climate change or something else, is very much a product of where we are now and the capabilities and the incentives that we face, which is why people in uh, really extreme situations uh, are, are unable to save for the future because they, the demands of today are overwhelming. So when we think about valuing the future, it, I don't see it as primarily a mindset thing. I think of it as a capabilities thing. Um, are we equipping ourselves to be able to make the investments in the future? Um, the floor is open to questions. Um, please, um, yeah, might, might start with you. Um, can we um, get a mic to, yeah. Kia ora, um, thank you to the panelists for your insights. My question is about whether you think there's a need to align New Zealand's economic interests with other values, particularly Te Tiriti o Waitangi and upholding a rules-based order. I'm referring to Charlie's opening about how New Zealand's economic interests lie strongly with China and North Asia. Um, and we're all aware that New Zealand is part of the Five Eyes and our fundamental allies like the UK and 
US, Australia have a lot of sharpening discourse against China, so my question is, do you see this as a problem? And if so, what should we be doing about it? So uh, my, my fellow panelists have decided that I'm the one to dispense, <laughs> to dispense policy advice to the New Zealand government. I would actually turn the, um, turn the, the question around and, and say that already this underpins New Zealand trade policy. Looking at what we've negotiated in the context of our FTA, um, New Zealand used to uh, introduce a general treaty of Waitangi clause in free trade agreements this has evolved significantly with the um, trade agreement with the UK and, and in particular with our uh, free trade agreement where we've got an entire chapter um, dedicated to that. Shared values, another, another example where you look at um, creating alliances with like-minded uh, countries in the face of um, uh, growing geostrategic competition. And I think the signal that this sends um, not only the FTA we've concluded, but also all the acronyms that you've thrown around uh, and the, the new initiative uh, by, the, by the US with, with IPEF that shows that in order to keep the international order alive, you need to work together also in, in, in trade terms. So I wouldn't think that this is only something for the future, but something that is already very much underpinning New Zealand's trade policy. Um, uh, the gentleman in the blue suit. Hi, uh, thank you for an excellent panel. Um, I was going to ask uh, about this suggestion about reducing non-tariff barriers through mutual recognition, because it's obviously a, a great idea, but uh, also there is the obvious asymmetry between the EU, which is the regulatory superpower that defines international standards for increasing you know, amounts of trade, uh, and New Zealand, which is 100 times smaller, and so the mutual recognition probably will be hard. So. Are there opportunities for unilateral recognition? And building on that, uh, would EU consider sort of taking on board a view of other smaller economies that are de facto uh, regulated through the decisions in Brussels to kind of uh, enable this mutual element in the unilateral recognition, which is probably a lot more easier and uh, efficient? So that's an excellent question. I think it's important to remember that mutual recognition agreements, it's not so much about negotiating power. It's if in a specific sector, two, two governments of different countries can agree that effectively the regulatory regime they have in place is equivalent, they're willing to accept it. So you know, it's not really about strength. So, to, so for an example, um, you can imagine potentially New Zealand and the UK could negotiate a deal recognising food safety regulatory standards are being equivalent and therefore then food products could go back and forth without needing to do compositional testing, new labelling, etc. So, so I don't think necessarily it's, a, it's affected by the power play. Should, should we get a question from this side of the room? You guys are quite quiet. Um, any questions from this side of the room? You only get five seconds to decide and then it goes back to that side. So. No questions on this side of the room, okay. It's quite a few on this side, so yes, please, yeah. Yep. Oh, um, sorry, yeah, um, first you and then you. Yeah, Jada. sorry. Uh, sorry, I just got a question for Natasha and this talk around codependency and how that's better than trust. And when I think about that in the New Zealand context, I feel like it's quite a scary thought because it requires us from going to be, I guess from, they're supplying product to be involved in production. And in terms of, I guess, products we do supply, um, I guess it's just more how do you see us moving towards that type of model given the uniqueness of New Zealand's economy, given, you know, we're not the most, like, the best located to be codependent on other people, and how uh, currently a lot of our relationships are formed on this trust. How can we, from, I guess, a New Zealand point of view create this codependency <coughs> given our position in the world, the type of products we produce. Thanks. Well, it's, it's not always easy for the reasons that you have pointed out. Um, I don't think it necessarily always means 
moving from a trading relationship to an investment relationship. Um, although I think there are other ways in which you can build those capacities for, for mutual surveillance uh, and for playing a more integral part in a sort of complex web of, of connections rather than just one single point in a, in a you know, with a, just a buyer-seller relationship. And that could be around uh, avoiding, for instance, exclusive distributorship relationships. And, and um, it may mean making a bigger investment, but then when you're, when you're fronting your own product in market, which, so yes, you might need to be in market, but then you're no longer dependent on your distributor as the single point of contact with, with the, all of your customers, and you can develop multiple points of contact and be p much more part of the, um, the business community in the place that you are, sort of with structural linkages, not just necessarily um, personal, you know, I know that guy, but actually, I do business. You know, uh, and that we we have a variety. And it might mean more local sourcing offshore, um, but I think that you know the specifics will depend very much on on what particular product and firm characteristics we're talking about. Uh, the very small size of a lot of New Zealand's companies. You know, so so we have a small number of very you know big companies that account for huge volumes of our exports, but numerically, of course, we've got a lot of very small companies, and it is difficult for them to move to more central positions. Um, and that is something, I think, as a task for the, for the NZ Inc. structure around the domestic side of New Zealand to think about how do we grow our companies bigger to enable them to engage in, in more multifaceted ways. Um, we had a question um, from the person with the white scarf. Did you, did you still want to ask your question? Yeah, yeah, yes, you. <laughs> Thank you very much. My question will be for uh, Sarah. You mentioned that maybe New Zealand has reached its limit regarding FTA, like conventional way to do business. Uh, so I'm thinking on the relationship between New Zealand and developing countries, maybe small partners, uh, where the FTA may not be the way to advance. So for those economies, uh, what will be the, the way to go forward regarding trade relationship if it's not an FTA, if FTA is not an option, what will be your suggestion? Thank you very much. It's a good question, and I think I would point to what I was saying. If, if the bilateral objective, when you're talking about New Zealand's relationship with a developing country, if, if the objective was to reduce a tariff from one side or the other, again, it's about coming up with creative, mutually beneficial arrangements whereby someone might want to unilaterally tariff, you know, reduce a tariff that is problematic in return for something that they value. So I think it's, if an FTA is off the cards but you still want to foster a relationship, you just need to think a bit more creatively and I think that that's something that we've got to become um, more willing to do and, and better equipped to do. We're doing actually really well, fitting in lots of questions in the small amount of time we had. I think we only have about four more minutes though, so I won't waste time doing a summary. I think we have time for two quick questions. Um, yes. Uh, thank you. So we have an online attendee asking the question, what is the future of international e-commerce on domestic markets? <laughs> so I confess this is not my specialist subject, and I think when you're on a panel with an ambassador, you always hope to pass the mic, but no one seemed to want it. So um, I think obviously the development of e-commerce is having a, a, a significant impact on the New Zealand um, retail market in particular. I don't have the stats to hand, but sales via Alibaba, Amazon, eBay, etc., have been growing rapidly for years, and that is putting pressure on, on domestic retailers. But on the flip side, you know, it's also creating more choice for consumers and driving price competition. So I think we're going to continue to see um, stores moving online. Um, personally, I think you know, there, there is a lot of benefit to that, um, but clearly we're going to need to ensure that we adequately regulate, regulate that so that people have you know, good consumer recourse if things go wrong and they've bought them from an e-commerce retailer off, offshore. Lucky last question. Yes. Thank 
you. That was a phenomenal panel. My question is, how significant will the existing trade institutions be for the future, particularly the WTO, um, now that the appellate body is quite redundant? Where will states go to resolve their trade disputes? I'd love to answer that question. Um, so, so what I think it's really important to realise is it is unfortunate to see the, the paralysis at the WTO dispute settlement body, but 99.5 plus percent of all international trade related disputes are not resolved at the WTO. They're resolved via commercial negotiations, arbitration, mediation, court proceedings, etc. So, so whilst that that the paralysis at the appellate body is disappointing. To be honest, disputes are still being resolved. And actually, I think what I would say, a call to the universities is um, when we do our international trade law papers, there's so much focus on dispute settlement via the WTO. But as I said, 99.5% of disputes aren't resolved there. So I do think it would be helpful if the universities would start to train some of our graduates in dispute resolution via negotiation, mediation, arbitration, court proceedings, because actually we really need those skills in civil society, in private practice, um, and in government. Um, you've just earned yourself a guest lecture spot in my class. <laughs> <laughs> um, if I could just, um, there's a comment, a question that came in much earlier, but it's been sitting in my head, and that was the one about values and trade. And it's a very difficult one, and, I ha and it is something I actually think about at night. Um, and I, I don't have a clear answer, but one of the things I would observe is that um, you'll know the saying, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. And um, sometimes I think we have an instinctive wish to be on the side of angels and to steer away from things that appear unpalatable. But you don't know truly um, what events you might be putting in motion and what the moral repercussions of those things are. Um, and you know, a lot of the questions where values and human rights and development and labor rights and all of these things and our consumer products, and we think about them with a lot of anxiety, at least I do, um, it, it's not clear to me that um, there is, that, you know, it's, things are often a lot more murky than you might like to think. Um, and, and so sometimes being, a, I won't say giving up on your values, but at least giving them a second thought to think, well, am I really helping um, you know, if in, in this scenario, yeah. Um, so I really enjoyed that panel. Um, I have a very simple job now, which is just to thank um, our panelists. And um, Luke, I think you have some gifts for the, the panelists to give. Um, I also just wanted. <laughs> and um, so lunch is being served. I just very quickly wanted to thank um, NZIA for the opportunity to um, support this really great event. Um, also thank you um, to the CAPES team actually um, for just uh, doing a great job all the time. Thank you to the students. Um, thank you also to partners in the room and um, sort of our friends that we can see in here. So yep, lunch is served. Kia ora.